So lovely to see you and be with you. Thank you for leading us so beautifully this morning. Uh, I'm so excited to be with you this morning. And so good to see all of you. I, uh, I'm excited. I said to this, to this team earlier this morning, I, I want to be careful what I say and how I say it because excited is such a shallow word in some ways. You know, it seems like you're just all fleshly, carnally excited, but I'm excited about the year. Because I believe God's going to do amazing things this year <clears throat> that will blow your mind. Um, I'm blessed because I had a time away and could reflect and spend time with the family. You know, I said to my family, allow me just a few and just welcome all the people that are with us online. It's great to have you wherever you're watching from. Trust that you had a good break and some rest and that you're ready for the year. So, so just before I share this word this morning, just let me say I'm, I'm blessed. I'm, 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 I've learned so much in the last part of this year again because um, we really believe God to get our family together. And at one stage with all the COVID nonsense and all this stuff happening, it's, it, and lockdowns and travel bans, it just kept on looking more and more impossible that we would see them. And there was a longing in our heart. We put a high value on family, and we love being together. You know, we have uh, great times, challenging times, but good times together when we are together as a family. And we really believe God, and it was quite amazing for us <clears throat> when my son and daughter and their three kids from the UK showed up, and it was possible for them to come in, not knowing how they'll get out, but we'll worry about that later. I think there's just a word in that for some of you this morning, because some of you want to know how you're going to get in, when you get in, how you get out, when you get out. Sometimes you just need to get, just get in and worry later about how you get out. Uh, I thought that, that's just a good... Anyway, they came. And then it was impossible for our son and his wife to come from New Zealand, because, uh, not New Zealand, from Australia. And at the last minute, she was still writing exams, and he came in, and he showed up, and we thought, thank you, Jesus. There's three quarters of us here, and then, of course, a week ago, she arrived. And I thought, God, at, at one stage, I was desperate believing, and then I fall a little bit into unbelief and doubt, not knowing how it could happen and kind of settled for certain things. And God said to me, just keep on believing. And God did it. Yes. And he said to me again, never stop believing when I've given you a word, knowing that as I'm, and I'm able to do it on my terms. I think we're going to see God do things this year on his terms like never before. Amen? But he's going to do it. I want to talk to you this morning. If you would bear with me, I want to read you two scriptures and talk to you about several things, but I'm going to talk to you under the heading, the season you are in, the people you are with, and the outcome that you want. The, the season that we're in, the people that you are with, and the outcome that you want. I want us to read two scriptures, first out of Joshua chapter 1, and then out of Acts and, uh, and then I'll refer to a whole lot of others as, as, we, as we continue. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, assisting, saying, Moses, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. In every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand there before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for, this, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, 
my servant commanded you, do not turn from it to the right nor to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. <clears throat> this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Just want to repeat one verse, and then go to Acts chapter 3. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave nor forsake you. Then in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, just one verse. Verse 13, it's Peter and John that have gone to the temple. They have found a man that was paralyzed. They reached out to him and ministered to him the love, the life, and the power of God. And he's now jumping and leaping and praising God. Amen? And uh, in chapter 3, verse 13, it says, The God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let go of him. The God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus. I want to talk to you this morning about the season that we're in, the people that you are with, and the outcome that you want. Amen? Why don't you say that with me? The season that we are in, the people that we are with, and the outcome that I want. Amen? I want you to listen carefully this morning. I want to encourage you, because I believe this is going to be a good year. Now, let, let me encourage you, regardless of where you are and what's happening in your life. We, we see, you see, I want to say this to you this morning. When we talk the word, when we speak the word, when we talk faith, we are not denying facts. We just have a greater reality. It's very important that we understand that. I think one of the things that God's going to call his people to this year is to that greater reality. I think sometimes, including myself, we are too easily moved and affected by the natural. And God says, I don't want you to deny the natural, but I want you to know there's a greater reality because I'm a God of the supernatural. And when you turn towards me and align with me, I can do things that are extraordinary. I can shift things and move things and assign angels that will blow your mind and change your situation without me giving you a three-point plan. So we are still in a time where we are uncertain about the unknown. Because if I sit down and we analyze and we look at stats and everything else happening, somehow things pop up and things happen that still causes us to feel uncertain because of the, we don't always know what to make of life. We don't always know where we fit in. We, I've heard people speak as we holidayed with people and communicated with people and connected with people. I hear the desire to have hope, the confidence in a certain sense, but the uncertainty in another way because nobody can predict the future. Nobody can just walk out and say, let me tell you what has happened in the last two years. These are the stats. We've analyzed it. Statistics shows us this. Therefore, it's going to work out like this, this, and this. Nobody can do that. God wants us to trust Him. God wants us to rely upon Him. God wants us to know that even at times, everything is changing. There's a scripture in Isaiah that says God's going to do a new thing. And when he says that new thing is done, we don't know what that new thing looks like always. It will have elements of the old and elements of things that we don't know in it. But God will do something and he's inviting us into it. But it causes us to sometimes feel uncertain about ourselves, uncertain about life uncertain about the economy, uncertain about where church fits into this whole thing and what church is supposed to look like. There's so many opinions. It's an amazing thing to me when I sit down and hear people speak and everybody shares something from their perspective or their opinion. And it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it's not the only way. Amen? 
And so it causes people to be uncertain. But, but it's here in Joshua that God is speaking to Joshua, and he's speaking to the people of God, and he's making a statement about the season that they're in. They are, they are a people of God that just came out of slavery. God sent Moses. Moses, Moses responded to the call. God to meet God in a very powerful way, had an encounter with God, and responded to the call of God to lead God's people out of Egypt. They are a bunch of people that have now been there for 400 years and have been so affected and influenced by the culture, the values, and the ways of the Egyptians, and the way that they've been lorded over and ruled over, that they have got a slave mentality and temperament. God was going to do something, not just getting them out of Egypt, but changed what is in them so that they could be his peculiar people. And, and so Moses, in all, that he's, in all that he is, responds to God uh, in his, in his uh, weakness and uncertainty, and God does something phenomenal in leading him, out, him and the people out. And then, of course, Moses dies, and we get to this place where Joshua has to take over, and Joshua takes over and leads the people further and into the promised land. And the season that the people find, listen carefully, the season that the people find themselves in is very important because it causes uncertain, uncertainty in their hearts. They still got a sense of a slave mentality. The work is not completely finished, and they have lost their key leader, and they're uncertain. And God speaks to his people, and he says this to them, and I want to speak to you concerning your season. Listen carefully. The God that led you out of Egypt through Moses is the same God that lead, will lead you further with Joshua into the promised land. Let me say it this way. The God that you knew before COVID is the same God that was with you in COVID and is the same one that's going to be on the other side of COVID. You need to get that. You see, the leadership might change. The styles, the methods they may change. The problems might be different. The situations might be different. The battles and the struggles that we face might be different. But the God that we serve is still the same. And one of the biggest challenges that I don't know about you, as we sit here, it doesn't matter who you are, we become so aware of what people do, don't do, what the circumstances are all about, and how different it is. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm faced with. You don't know what it is that I'm battling with. It doesn't really matter what it is. And I'll say that respectfully. Please hear me. Don't get offended with me before we started this morning. But I say that respectfully. It doesn't really matter what it is that you go through, what it is that you're struggling with, what kind of battle that you're facing, how different it is from mine. The issue that you need to realize, the God that's walking with you and me is the same God. That's the focus. The season that we're in allows us to walk with the same God. It is in Joshua chapter 1 verse 16 through 18 that the people begin to realize that when they say to, to Joshua, they say, whatever you tell us to do, we will do. Whatever it is that you say we must do, we will do. That wherever you tell us to go, there we will go. We just demand one thing, that the God that was with Moses be with you. Hey, listen. It's not really about your style. It's not really about your method. It's not really about your way. It's not really about the program that we run. It's not really about how we do it, how sharp, how whatever it is. It's really where the God's in the deal. And in the season that we're in, I want to say this to you. Make sure that you've got a clear-cut focus on who is with you. And God says in Hebrews chapter 3, 13, verse 5, I am with you always, and I will never leave nor forsake you. Now, now, what is important about it is that we need to know that. And if we know that, we will behave like that. Because many times people say, of course I know God's with us. Then we need to behave like that. You see, we can't be up and excited and full of faith and confident about life and the year just when we sing together in the church or when we sing together in a small group, or when we converse with, it needs to show when we are alone on Monday morning. 
It needs to show on Wednesday afternoon when you're in the middle of the week and it doesn't play out or work out the way that you want it to work out because of the circumstance, the situation, or what happens around you. It needs to show in every situation all the time that there's a deep conviction with the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ and his people that we know and understand when God said, I'm with you, he's with you. And when it's God, Jehovah, that's with you, then it's quite someone that is with you, and therefore you don't have to be fearful, anxious, panicky, negative, critical, skeptical, cynical, and all the other things that goes with it, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We don't ignore the facts, but it doesn't really matter what happens around you, who's around you, and what's not happening around you, because God's with you. In the season that you find yourself in, it is very important that you and I make a note right here in the beginning of the year, because I want to tell you something, you're going to face many more uncertainties and challenges. You're going to face people full of cynicism, skepticism, and negativity. You're going to face people that look at life differently, and even Christians that look at life differently, and are not going to be all excited about life. And that's the time that you need to make sure that you know and understand God is with you. I can preach on that this morning. Paul said it, and others spoke about it. He says, there's been times Paul writes about it. He says, that nobody was with me. Nobody stood with me but God. David wrote about it in times of his life when he was totally forsaken and felt alone. And he said, but God is with me. It is very important for you and me in the day and the time, the season that we're in, that you are confident, totally, totally persuaded, and believe that God is with you in the season. Second thing that is important that we want to analyze and just look at this morning is the generational issue. You know, in Acts chapter 3, verse 13, it says, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob has done this thing. And it's very interesting for me, and when you read the Bible, that often, well, actually, in a few places in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God is referred to as the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's a reason why God has done that. Why he speaks about himself as the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. This is God confirming that he is a generational God. This is God committing that he's in things for the long run. This is God saying, I make promises not just to a certain generation, but to all generations. Did you hear that this morning? You see, when we are where we are at this moment in this season and in this time of the kingdom, there are generations coming together more so than ever before. We've heard this message so many times before about God that's a God of generations and how the one generation need to pass baton on to the next generation. But we live in a day and a time where God is going to do a multi-generational thing. I said a while ago, God's doing a new thing and God is using whosoever is putting up his hand and say, God, I'm available. Doesn't matter how old or how young you are, God will do it through a Joshua and a Caleb, also through a Mary and a David. He'll do it through a Samuel that says, speak God, I'm listening. Whoever is listening and prepared to align themselves with God will see God come upon them, work in them and work through them and do whatever he wants to do upon the face of the earth. But it's a multi-generational thing. And I want to talk to you about that this morning so that you don't get discouraged because it's very dangerous for this moment in time when God wants to do something significant and powerful that we find ourselves in a situation where people clash with one another and, and, and allow the devil to cause division and disunity when God wants to bring generations together. You know, one of the things which is not always nice to talk about is in this time when we live in where there are so many different opinions about COVID and vaccine and no vaccine and conspiracy theories and all this. And, and, and I really don't care what people's opinions are. I just want to know how they behave. I say to them, whatever you believe, don't forget to look like a Christian when you do. Amen. Don't forget when you are 
strongly convinced in your persuasion of what you want to do and how you live and what you really believe and what you agree and don't agree with, make sure that you make Jesus look attractive. Can I get an amen on that, please? So, so it's not just my conviction and my revelation and my angle that I'm on. It's what Jesus, the way we display Christ, because we are here to represent and reflect Christ. And so it's important that we understand. And, and many times when you're in this situation, we, you know, when we had this holiday, <clears throat> we were 17 people in the house, three generations, grandfather and grandmother, sons and daughters, grandchildren. And it's an amazing thing how you have to accommodate one another because there are moments of euphoria where you're so excited and so blessed that God is so good and so kind and so amazing and how blessed we are. And there are moments where you believe it's time for everybody to leave. <laughs> now. Not tomorrow. Now. Where cousins have got cousins' toys and cousins have got cousins' hair. And cousins don't speak with normal voices. They're just screeching and screaming. And you're trying to calm the whole thing down and it doesn't work. There's no authority that wants to calm that thing down. And so to bring generations together requires the wisdom of God and the insight of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not about a program. It's not about us agreeing on theology. It's not about us having all the facts together and doing everything that's right. It's about accommodating generations with an insight and with a wisdom through the power of God so that the fullness of God can be expressed through our lives, in our midst, to cities and neighborhoods because God is a family God. God's not really interested in just us doing our own thing. God is a God that puts the som a solitary in families. God plants you, and he says he puts every b member in the body where it pleases him. God plants us. And even though God um, raises up, uh, us up individually, he makes us part of the bigger body of Christ and part of the family. And so when God um, is moving at this moment in time, it is very important for us not just to understand that it's a season of uncertainty and turmoil and storms, but that God is with you. He will never leave nor forsake you. He will take you all the way. It's also important that you and I understand who we travel with and who are the people with us, and it's a multi-generational thing. We are not here just to tolerate one another. Come on, say that, tolerate. We are not here, even though it's sometimes uncomfortable, we will speak the truth in love so that the liberty and the freedom of Christ can manifest in our lives and that we can be an accurate manifestation and representation of Christ. So it's important that we understand generations, that God says it's a multi-generational thing. And I want you to know that I'm the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, not just the God of Abram and not just the God of Jacob. I'm the God of multi-generations. I'm in this thing for the long haul. I'm not a flash in the pan. I'm not just a, uh, a meeting God. I'm not just here to do a conference. I'm not just here to do a once-off thing, an event. I'm here for the long haul. I'm a God of eternity, and I'm going to work it in you, your son, and your son's son. And for that, you need to understand God is in it for the long, he's committed. And then what is important, the promise he gives to Abram is the promise he gives to Isaac and Jacob. So let me talk to you quickly about that. So regardless of the season and the circumstance, the economy and the people around you, God is the same. His promises are yes and amen. The people are the same and the outcome is the same. So let's just talk about it quickly so that we understand what were the similarities I want you to look at the similarities. Listen carefully. You need to get this word this morning with me. You need to look at the similarities so that we can walk in unity together forward. You need to see the possibilities in the season. Otherwise, all you see is it's a different season. It's a difficult season. It's a hard season. It's a different season from your season. And the issue is not really the season. The issue is the God that's with you. If you don't understand that God's doing a generational thing and discern generations correctly, you will get cheesed off, irritated, and frustrated with different generations. I don't know what I'm talking about. 
I, I, I hear it sometimes when my children say, oh, dad. And I say, just change that tone of voice. We're still brying in my house tonight. And I'm supplying the biggest steaks. I, I, I hear when, when we sometimes say to my wife, hey, these children, you know, if they could just take the plates out that day. And God says, I want you to, if you don't look at the right thing, you'll look at what's wrong and where they miss it. And you will not allow me to do something extraordinary, phenomenal in this moment in time because it's a season in which God is going to move in such an amazing way that will blow your mind, but not on your terms or my terms, on His. And one of it involves generations. Let's look at it for a moment, just quickly, so that you and I can understand how we talk to one another and relate to one another. How did Abram, Isaac, and Jacob had similarities so that God blessed them three generations regardless. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not going to give you all the scriptures. I'm going to just mention the commonalities. Number one, all three of them were liars. <laughs> Abram lied. Isaac lied. And Jacob lied. Abram lied about his wife, Sarah, when he felt threatened. Isaac lied about his wife when he felt threatened. And Jacob lied to his father. They were all liars. The crux of the story is this. God uses ordinary people. God calls ordinary people, people with flaws, people that might sometimes walk in pride and self-confidence, people that that do things in their way, in their own righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ, God still sees the best in you and wants to use you in spite of you. And people say, well, there's a generational curse on the family. I know there might be one, but Jesus came to break the curse, and in spite of it, he's still got a plan for your life and your whole family. If you've ever been to a place where you think, well, I want, you know, we are just useless with this. My dad didn't do well. My brother or my uncle didn't do well. I'm not doing so well. I wonder how much. Maybe we, no, God says, don't give up. I broke the curse, and I've spoken out a blessing, and I've got a purpose and a plan for you, your children, and your children's children for generations. I can change your purpose, your destiny forever if you would turn to me. God uses ordinary people. And they might have different issues. They might not be liars. They might have some other issues. But listen to me carefully. You've got issues that your children have got, that their children have got. The issue is that their issue might be different from your issue. God used people with issues. So don't look for people that are perfect. Don't look for people to do it all right. When I look at my children, when I look at my grandchildren, I know that I need to not tolerate them. I need to accommodate them as a father and a grandfather to help them in the process of getting to know God and discovering truths that will liberate and set them free. Just like Isaac got set free and Jacob wrestled with the angel and found his destiny, God uses ordinary people. Number two, they were all heirs of the same promise. You know, I, I'm, I'm quite amazed how people sometimes, we, we want to be significant. We, we want to have a sense of purpose and destiny. And, and sometimes we want to make it feel or sense like we've got something more special to do than anybody else or God's got a more special place for us than anybody else. I've got bad news for you. That's a lie. Whatever God wants you to do is as special as the next person next to you. It might just be a different assignment. And God feels exactly about you as he feels about the person next to you. God loves the whole world equally. God is not a respecter of person and show no favoritism to man. Amen? What is so amazing is when you go and read the Bible is that God made the promise, and I want to read you that promise. Listen carefully because it's going to be important for you and me to understand that this morning. In Genesis chapter 12, he says to Abram, he says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That very promise and that very covenant that God makes with Abram, if you carry on reading, I think it's in Genesis 26, he makes that same promise to Isaac. As I promised your father, and it's, the, it's a fourfold promise, I'll give you land, I'll make your descendants many, and I will bless you, and I'll make you a blessing. Did you get that? He says, listen, Isaac, I will give you land. I will multiply your descendants. I will bless you, and I will make you a blessing. Somewhere later, I think it's in Genesis chapter 28, when it's Jacob's turn, God said to him, I know you are a conniver. I know you're a liar, but listen, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to multiply your descendants. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing. Listen, you don't have to worry about somebody being more blessed than you. You don't have to worry about God giving somebody else favor that you won't get. You don't have to worry about God opening doors for other people that he won't open for you. God will open every door that needs to be opened for you so that you can walk into the fullness of what God has got for you, so that you can experience the kindness, the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the provision, the protection, and the guidance of God for your life because the inher we are heirs of the same promise. All the promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe. Will you lay hold, listen carefully, will you stop competing and comparing with other people? Will you stop looking at other people, what they do and what they don't do? And will you lay hold of your inheritance of what God's calling you to, to lay hold of so that you can be blessed and be a blessing? Third thing that is important that they had in common. Listen, listen carefully, church. I want to share with you an important thing this morning. We're setting ourselves up for the year. God's going to move and God's going to do things. And Satan will do everything to distract you this year. Just like he did with the Omicron. He will try to distract you. He will try to get you discouraged and despondent. This wave, that wave, this economy, this strike, this electri uh, electrical breakdown, this failure here, this whatever it is. He will get you when the one thing is over with the next thing to get you to a place where you're more aware of circumstances, situation, and funny people. And God wants you to know it's not really about the situation, the circumstance, and what happens around you. It's who's with you. And you and I will face the truth and the reality of that in our own hearts as we live, walk, and speak this year as a people who really believe that. Secondly, I don't want you to get robbed because you look at people with a critical, skeptical, negative, or a judgmental eye because you do not understand that God's going to use people. I saw the other day an uh, ad where people advertised something about a prophetic word that God spoke to, uh, to Jeffrey's Bay, and, and uh, it was quoted, um, and it was words that was prophesied from this stage by men and women that were in this church, and somebody said to me, did you see that they quoted the prophetic word that was over our church and that was prophesied here? They just took it and they just declared it over wherever they declared it. What are you going to do about it? I said, nothing, because it's not our word, it's the word to the body of Christ. We were just privileged to have the platform ready for that word to be spoken. But I want to tell you, if you do not discern it correctly, and if you do not uh, facilitate it correctly, you might get bent out of shape and not get blessed by what God's doing. Yeah. Discern it correctly. Number three, they were all pilgrims. In, Act, in Psalms 84, Verse 5, I think it says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, By faith Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. 
By faith, he dwelled in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him in the same promise. For he waited for a city which has no foundation, whose builder and maker is God. I want to tell you something, and I talk to myself, and I think sometimes as the church, we are just a little bit too carnal. We are just too aware of our physical situation, well-being, and what's happening around us. We're too focused on the next job, the next car, the next house, the, the, the next whatever promotion, the next breakthrough. Sometimes we spiritualize that. We, we just too focus on my next ministry opportunity or my ministry that I can start. We, 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 are, we wanna see things happen and we're not aware of something greater that we're looking for, this God amongst us, this presence that breaks yokes and destroys chains and brings healing, this, this presence that changes our lives to, and, and, and encourages us to behave in a way that's different from the world so that when people look at us and are with us, it makes Jesus attractive. They were all pilgrims. They, they knew that life was much more to than just the natural that we live in and the physical things that we're experiencing. There's something greater to look for when you look for God, for intimacy, for his presence, for his way, for kingdom culture, and advancing the kingdom. And when you look for that, it looks different, smells different, and it is different. They were pilgrims, all of them. Two more. They all had wives that couldn't have children. All three of them. God says to Abram, Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land, your own land, so that you are not governed by others, manipulated or controlled, where you can freely worship, establish my ways, my conducts, my mannerism, and live out my values and be a people, a peculiar people, a people set aside for me. People that will be yielded to me and love me and obey me. I'm going to give you land and I'm going to multiply you, Abram. And Abram waits and he's waiting and he's waiting. And you know the story. And eventually he's 100 years old before Sarah had Isaac. And he says, fantastic, Lord. One boy, how is that the sand like the sand of the sea? And then he says, but Abram... Isaac will fulfill that. And Isaac and Rebekah gets married, and they are barren. She's barren. And if you go and read in Genesis 20, 28, I think it's a 25, it says, 20, it says that she got so despondent and discouraged that she wanted to die. She says, here I get this promise, and I've got no children. And they were married for 20 years before she had her first, first son. And of course, the same with with Jacob, Jacob and Rachel, who cries out to God and say, you've made all these promises. But here's the thing. I want to say this to you this morning. They knew that they had a promise of growth, multiplication, favor, and blessing, but they couldn't accomplish it in their own strength. And nothing happened until they totally, listen carefully, until they totally surrender to God their strengths, their weaknesses, and all that they are, so that God could take what is barren and multiply it. There's some of you sitting here this morning, you got promises from God and prophecies from God, and it's not happening because you are still holding on to it, trying to make it work, planning your own thing, working out your own thing. And, and John's right, right about it in John 12, 24, when he says, most assuredly I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. They knew that if God gave them a promise, and if God is with them, and God gave a generational promise, and he gave them all the same promise, regardless of what they experience or don't experience, God will make it come to pass if they surrender it to God and not give up. Last one. They were all well diggers. They dug wells. Abram dug seven wells. He didn't just go into the land that God gave him and waited for the rain to fall. 
God gave him insight and understanding to dig wells so that there will be water at times when they need it. And Abram dug seven wells. His son Isaac, after him, came back. Let me just go back to you. I just want to say something about the previous point, about all the wives being barren. You know, when Abram believed God, it was quite something for him to believe God at a very ripe and old age and not to give in, even though him and Sarah both laughed and said, how will it ever be possible for us to have children? They laughed and God says, I saw you, but I'm going to do it anyway. And they got the son at a very late age. I want to say to you, you know, one of the most amazing things about Isaac is he never blamed his father because his wife was barren. He took the promise that comes from the same God and said, if that God that was with my father is my God, and if that God can make it come to pass in his life, then he can make it come to pass in my life. And he got his breakthrough. There's some of you sitting here, I sit with this often, and I understand that we need to counsel people and help them through, and there's different dynamics of this where we deal with hurts of the past and things of the past and parents that didn't do it and leaders that didn't do it, and I understand that. But I tell you what you need to do is you need to get your eyes on the God that's greater than the people that disappointed you and let you down and couldn't get it together. Come on. Because you can get your own breakthrough regardless of what they did and didn't do and whether they did it in time or not. And so Isaac, and they were also well diggers. They were people that didn't just sit and wait for God to do things. They got the promise, the blessing, and the direction, and so they farmed, but they dug wells. And Isaac didn't just dig his own two wells. Also at the time when he took over from his father, he opened up the wells that, that got um, blocked up. So he went back and opened the wells that was filled up and, and rejuvenate uh, what came out of that. Uh, uh, the, the people was rejuvenated what came out of that. So, and Jacob, of course, had a well that we read of in John chapter 4. The woman at the well, she was sitting at Jacob's well. They were well diggers. I want to say this to you. I, I really believe this. I said this to the team this morning. Over the last few years, God has spoken very strongly prophetically to his people concerning the voice of God. If there's one thing that the prophetic did well over the last few years is not just prophesy, but teach the people how to hear God's voice and speak the voice of God for themselves. I, I was very encouraged by that over the last few years because they're not this unique group of people sitting in a corner and everybody needs to run to them and get a word from them. God says, you can all hear my voice. Now, I still honor and respect the office but the big thing is that we can all hear the voice of God. And a lot of what happened over the last few years is God has said to his people, I love you, I approve of you, I accept you, you are the righteousness of Christ, find your identity, I'm going to do something. And God has built the church up so much through prophetic word coming from the outside in, from prophetic word coming from the inside out, that they know that God loves them and cares about us. And God says, but what I want you to do now is I want you to obey my word and dig some wells. Are you listening to me? We can't just sit in a circle and prophesy over one another and pray for one another. We need to get out there. And Jesus says that in, his new, in the New Testament. He says, if you come to me, I'll give you living water. And if you keep on drinking of that living water, it will spring up in you as rivers of living water. And wherever you move, you will be a living well with springs of living water that doesn't just prophesy but makes a difference in this world because we need people with revelation, wisdom, and insight that start new businesses, that get new ideas, that know how to in, in, uh, engage with people and make a difference in marriages, in business, and in every sector of life because they have got a word from God and will go out on the mission to dig a well and bring hope. What am I saying to you this morning? Listen carefully. I want to encourage you for the year. I want to say to you, you and I are going to go through some challenges this year and all kinds of different issues that we need to face the issue is not the situation, the circumstance. The issue is that we've got God with us that will never leave nor forsake us. And you need to hold on to that with all your heart. Second thing that's important. God says, I'm not going to do it through lone rangers. 
There's no one church, no one pastor, no one ministry, no one any, anybody that's going to do it and with who God's going to do it. God says, I'm going to do a multi-generational thing because I'm a long-term God. I'm a committed God. I'm a God that loves people. I use flawed people, so don't look for perfection. Look at available people, committed people, devoted people, and willing people and accommodate them because I'm going to do something out of the ordinary that doesn't fit your box. Just remember... Whatever I call them to do is what I call them to do. The promise is yes and amen to all of you. Don't try to copy them. Don't try to be like them. Just do what I tell you to do. You'll live a fulfilled life. And I'm telling you that when you get out there, I'll give you your land. I give you your descendants. I'll multiply you. I'll bless you. And the reason why I'm going to do, listen carefully, the reason why I'm going to do all of that is so that you can be a blessing to a lost and dead world. I'm not just blessing you to bless you. I'm not just blessing you so that you can sit in your comfort zone. It's not just natural blessings. It's not just physical blessings. I want to do a spiritual thing so that you walk on this earth as a people that are looking for something more than just the natural so that you can stimulate and stir a hunger in the lost world out there and at the same time be a well of living water, a spring of the Holy Spirit that is a blessing to others around you. The result, you know what's the most amazing thing? In spite of Abram, his shortcomings, his lies, and his mishaps, in spite of Isaac and what he's gone through, and Jacob the conniver, his name means conniver, who wrestled with God, all of them came through, walked into the fullness of God, experienced the blessing of God, and became a blessing in their generation. And I want to say this to you this morning, 2022, is going to be a year where God is releasing His blessing on His people, releasing His blessing through His people, and we're going to be a living well of living water if we focus on the right thing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. One of the things that we sometimes miss in church is I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm so desperate in where I'm at. I'm so determined. And I think the better word would be desperate for God to do something in my life. Whatever it might be, whether it's my personal life and my walk with God, whether it's in the area of health, whether it is in an area of finances, relationships. I'm so desperate because I have tried everything like Abram and Isaac and Jacob to see an offspring come out of this whole thing, for things to happen and multiply, and nothing happens. You, you, after 20 years of marriage, she's still barren. You, you, and you think, I'm so desperate, and one of the most challenging things for me, listen carefully now, it's very important, is that sometimes I come here and I want somebody to just lay hands on me, prophesy over me, pray for me, let the, thank you, spit fly everywhere, excuse me for that one. I want them to pray with zeal and zest and determination and conviction. And nothing happens. And God would say to me, no, I want you to walk out of here and not look for anybody to pray for. Not that that's not right to look for. Listen carefully what I want to say. I want to make a point. Both is right. I don't want you to look for. I want you to make sure this morning before you walk out of here that I am truly the God that you focus on and that you're not looking around and that you really believe that I'm with you this whole year, especially next week Friday. What happens there? I don't know. It'll just be next week Friday and I will forgot that I preached this. He says, I want you to know that you need to be determined and deliberate and intentional in how you walk with other people because some of the blessings come in your way and some of those that open the door, if you do not approach them right, you might sideline them, reject them, or be offish with them and rob yourself from what I want to do with, in, and through you because of the person that I use generationally 
and where they're from. And thirdly, there are things that I want you to do that I'm not going to do because I've done it 2,000 years ago on the cross. I paid the price, nailed the devil. And what I want you to do is I want you to stop and start. Stop eating three chops. And walk around the block twice. I said, I would really like somebody to lay hands on me, prophesy over me, cast that thing out. God said, we're not going to cast that out. We're going to dig a well of health. We're going to dig a well of stewardship. We're going to dig a well of relationship and accountability. Come on, somebody help me. It's, that's when I leave this nice environment and feel a bit despondent and I want to break that spirit of despondency over you this morning and say to you, this God that's with you, He's going to help you through your desert situation. When it feels like all you're doing is licking sand, God says, I will be a cloud and a fire column. I will provide food and your clothes will not wear out. In this season, until you get to the promised land, I am God and I'm going to be with you. The people, God says to Joshua, go into the promised land, you and all the people I give you. Can't just go there by yourself. Are you listening? God's with you. There's generations with you. And the outcome is what God wants for you. And you'll get it when you and I respond in obedience to what He says to us. It's not just a prayer. It's not just a feeling. It's a step of obedience as we go out there to say, Lord, help me to dig a fresh well so that rivers of living water can come forth out of my life, out of my family, out of my finances, out of who I am, and I can be blessed, but be a blessing to those around me. Amen? Father, I pray. Won't you lift your hands, please? Father, we thank you this morning for your people. I thank you that you love them, that you care about them. Thank you, Lord that you are with each and every one. Thank you that the promise is for all generations. Thank you that it's the same promise, that you're a promise keeper. And thank you, Lord, that you're going to give us the strength and the energy and the ability to practically, practically engage with you so that life will look different by the end of this year because of the goodness of Jesus. Amen.